So now to introduce our speakers this evening. Um, we're fortunate to have the three co-editors of a book, um, uh, Henrietta Liston's Travels, um, the Turkish Journals, 1812 to 1820, published last year by Edinburgh University Press. Um, and uh, the three speakers will each be presenting a part of the talk on the Liston papers um, uh, in, in no particular order. Um, I'll just introduce each speaker. Uh, Valerie Kennedy uh, is a, she teaches at Bill Kent University in Ankara uh, and uh, has published uh, many things amongst them. Uh, Edward Said, a critical introduction. Uh, which has been translated into Chinese, Korean, and Arabic. Um, also, Liminal Dickens, Rites of Passage in his work. Um, she's the author of Orientalism in the Victorian Era in the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Literature. Um, and she's published um, on literary works from authors like Maria Edgeworth and uh, Mohsin Hamid. Her current projects include editing a collection of essays entitled Egypt, Discourses of Travel, Exploration and European Power from 1750 to 1956. And also a monograph on British travellers to the Ottoman Empire, 1716 to 1850. Uh, Patrick Hart is also um, at Bill Kent University where he teaches English literature. He's the editor of the Journal of Northern, uh, of the Northern Renaissance. Uh, he coordinated um, uh, the joint project uh, between the National Library of Scotland and Bill Kent University, uh, Approaching Constantinople, it was titled, um, and uh, it resulted in a multi-platform publication of the Henrietta Liston uh, writings. Um, he's public poetics, theatre under lockdown, and teaching Shakespeare. In, and he's currently working on a short book on Anglophone travel writing about Turkey. Um, I'm being told my internet connection is unstable, but hopefully you can still hear me. Um, and uh, Dora Petherbridge is the curator of international collections at the National Library of Scotland. And uh, so this is a collaboration between Bill Kent University and the National Library of Scotland. And I'm, I'm delighted that uh, uh, we have uh, all three co-editors here today. And I'm going to invite Dora to start the presentation and introduce the listens. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Quentin, and thank you, Craig, so much for having us. It's always a, a happy thing to talk about the listings, but I think particularly to your audience and to all of you here, uh, it does feel like a group of friends, as Craig says. And I think we've even got a contributor to our Liston project here who has written a wonderful essay for us on um, on the Listons arriving in Constantinople, which we can direct you to at the end. But uh, Gerald has has been brilliant support throughout. So thank you, Gerald, and thank you, everybody. Um, before I share my screen, I'll just say a little more to add to uh, what Quentin's already introduced. I think we started this project about three years ago now, building up our knowledge of the Listons in the Ottoman Empire and of their lives as a whole through the Liston Papers Archive, which has been here at the National Library since 1936, when it was bought from the kind of last surviving members of their family. Uh, Patrick was the instigator. Um, he happened upon, through, through discussion with me, Henrietta's Turkish Journals and formed this wonderful idea for a book. And so I think the Liston papers and particularly Henrietta's Journals have been very hardworking these last three years. We've, uh, we've published them, we've put them online, we've invited con contributors to interpret them and they're now on exhibition at, uh, at the library. So if anybody's in Edinburgh between now and November, uh, you can come in and see the real, the real items themselves from the archive on display. Um, 
and that's just opened. So this feels like a very good time to be talking about her. So let me just share my screen to show you photographs of the list, no, not photographs, paintings of the listings, <laughs> paintings of the listings, um, which some of you may know, I don't know how many of you have encountered Robert and Henrietta before, uh, but here they are, and I hope you can see Robert and my face isn't obscuring him. We meet the listings through the archive in their middle age, I suppose, really, but our work on them in Turkey takes us to them in their 60s and 70s. But these, uh, these paintings were painted by a famous American artist, Gilbert Stewart, who famously painted George Washington. And they commissioned these portraits in uh, Philadelphia in 1800. And I, I personally love these images uh, and their eyes and their faces have become extremely familiar. So Henrietta was born in Antigua in 1751, and she was orphaned quite young at the age of about eight and sent to live with her uncle, who's her guardian in Glasgow. Robert, uh, who became an esteemed ambassador and diplomat and worked all over Europe, as well as the United States and the Ottoman Empire, he was born in West Lothian in 1742. They got married, uh, in 1796, quite late on in life, she was 44 and he was about eight years, nine years older. And then they traveled the world together. That's just a very quick potted history of their lives. But we have a huge amount of information about them, huge, in the List and Papers archive, which is all of their personal and diplomatic papers. Uh, you can see just a picture of the stack floors just now. I'm actually in the library on level 13 and all underneath my feet are our strong rooms and uh, somewhere beneath me is the List and Papers archive, which is 177 volumes of correspondence as wow. well as travel journals and maps and sketches and oversized manuscripts and all manner of additional material. So hundreds upon hundreds of documents, mostly letters, but all manner of wonderful, various, uh, surprising, unique material tells us, tells us all sorts about them, tells us very uh, everyday things, as well as giving us the great sweep of their professional uh, career and I've just popped that Monsieur Ambassador image up at the corner there because really it is an archive of diplomatic papers but because the Listons kept everything we get all of these insights into their personal lives and into Henrietta's personal life and her other interests. So to give you a little flavour of how far back we can go in the archive into Henrietta's life, we actually have the only record, the only surviving record of her birth. You can see there's um, a title page torn out of a volume of the New Testament, and on the other side of that title page was a family history written out, and Within the list is Henrietta Marchant, who was born on the 19th day of December, 1751. And it was only through working on this, Patrick, on this project with Patrick and Valerie that we discovered that record before we thought she was born in 1752, but the archive told us the correct date. Uh, and then on the other side is the Liston's marriage contract. And you can see both of their signatures uh, just in that image there. So it does offer these significant, very significant documents about their life, Henrietta's birth, and then her marriage, which changed her life. Because before that, she lived a secluded, relatively quiet life in Glasgow. And then when she married Robert, her world expanded into politics and diplomacy and travel and a whole new network of international connections. And one of the connections that she made was George Washington, President George Washington. The Listons married in 1796 and the very day of their wedding, they sailed from Portsmouth to New York, uh, moved to Philadelphia, which was then the capital of the United States and became friends 
and I suppose as um, personal and professional friends with George and Martha Washington. And this is the kind of gem that the archive contains, this wonderful dinner invitation. And it would have been Mount Vernon, his Virginia estate that they were invited to. And just as a very small taste of um, her American life, her life in America, which was four years, I'm going to read you a short extract of her American journals, which we have in the archive. So I, I, um, I don't know whether it was this dinner invite that relates to her observation, but it was certainly one of Washington's dinners that she said this, that she wrote this down. In America, she says, every lady is handed from the drawing room to the dining room, but should she, in the course of the day, have reason to walk across the room, a gentleman immediately offers his hand. In short, no woman moves in company without support. So that's just a taste of her writing and a taste of the kind of observation that we find nestled in all of the papers in the archive. But I want to skip over America, skip over the Liston's period of retirement after posts in Northern Europe to the Liston papers representing their life in the Ottoman Empire, which began in 1812 and lasted till 1820 when they finally retired and left Constantinople. So as you can see from this image, there's a variety of documents. We've got those two magnificent Ottoman firmans at the edges there, the, the Liston's traveling firmans, which they obtained so that they could move freely around the Ottoman Empire, uh, a selection of papers, her journals, other certificates and documents, and then that wonderful map, that hand-drawn map in the middle there. So from all of this variety of things, we began to research in detail the Liston's life in Constantinople and put together our book and our online resource and annotate Henrietta's travel journals, her Turkish travel journals. So this extensive archive has been a wonderful historical resource and it's, it's, um, I, it's not really yet fully explored. I think that we could all say that we have more to find out about the Liston's time in Turkey, different as aspects of it, perhaps uh, Henrietta's botany hasn't been as well researched as some of the other aspects of her life in Turkey. So you get a feel really from the, for the depths of the material that we were working with. Here's just one example. We found Robert Liston's cipher, his diplomat's cipher, which I think is early 19th century. Uh, he actually had been posted to Constantinople before in 1794 for a very short term uh, post. It was just one year uh, until 1795 before America. But when he went back, I kind of looked at what the codes are on this cipher, and I think it's actually dating from the Liston's second embassy. Uh, and it's so fascinating. I'm not sure whether you can read from my screen, but all of the vocabulary, all of the words uh, that he was putting in his official dispatches and his secret letters back to the government uh, uh, in Westminster. And um, there's Constantinople, which has three codes there and, oh, and city and coast and colonel and consul, of course, and Corfu. And here's just two other archival documents. I chose them for the contrast, actually, but I really the size is extremely different, but you can't tell from my slide. But that Furman, that Furman from 1815, which allowed the Listons to travel safely with protect, protection of Ottoman officials, is huge. And we had to uh, work very hard to fit it into our display cabinets at the Library for the Exhibition. And it's Perhaps I'm sure some of you know very well these, these documents, but it is um, very imposing and magnificent. And then on the other side, actually very small in actuality, Henrietta's meteorological diary, which she kept for the year of 1814 about the climate in Constantinople. And you can just see thunderstorms. So I'm not sure uh, those of you in Istanbul, what the weather is like today. <laughs> um, but it's really fascinating to look back and see uh, what the climate was. And she was fascinated by climate. She felt the heat intensely and she needed her garden to grow well 
was one of her great passions, so she kept re a record of the weather. Amongst all of those different kinds of documents, amongst the tiny little notes and letters and firmans and maps, Henrietta's travel writing is, is, was our main focus, is the jewel really, and has been, I think until now, until we began the project, overlooked. The research focus had been on Robert, of course, in his diplomatic work, but Henrietta's travel journals have been waiting for us for 200 years. Um, and this is her, the picture here is her 1812 to 1814 journal, the main journal that all of our work focused on. So you can see this scruffy volume has um, been through quite a life. And here it is next to the book that it turned into. That's our Edinburgh University Press publication that Quentin mentioned. And Patrick, in a, in a little while, will tell you how we got from manuscript to published edition. But that just gives you um, an impression of what, what her journal looked like. And this is it being prepared for all the work that we were going to do on it. It was relatively in good condition, I think, given it's had several sea voyages, but it needed a little work before we were able to digitize it, this, you know, for putting online purposes. And there it is in our conservation workshop. And here it is on display. I took this photo just a few days, days ago, so it's behind glass now, but there, in that opening, you can see uh, the style of her handwriting and the density of her of her filling the pages. And Patrick will zoom in, I think, to lots of extracts, which will give you a real good look at how she was writing. So before I hand over, I will tell you a little bit about the content of the journals and particularly about the Liston's arrival. This was their big climax to their career, Henrietta and Robert. And although Robert called it a frolic, their embassy, he said, was a frolic. It was, of course, a really serious undertaking. Uh, they were doing it against the background of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, the Sultan, Mahmoud II, was only in the fourth year of his reign. There were complex negotiations that Robert needed to uh, manage and um, make happen and make all right between Russia and France and Britain, of course. He had um, a quite a, a job looking after Britain's trading interests. And as he put it, he had to patch and palliate and maintain peace. He always said that he preached peace, peace, peace. The listeners also had the plague to deal with. They had a stream of international travellers passed through the embassy doors uh, and they had a lot of European contacts who they visited. So by the time they turn up in Constantinople on the 28th of June 1812, they have already had a six weeks Mediterranean voyage stopping off at Spain and Malta and Gibraltar and the Aegean Islands and Sicily. There's a great quotation up uh, just on the slide here. I'm sure you all know aristocratic traveller Lady Hester Stanhope uh, and her and her adventures and her character and her eccentricities, but she had many snobby things to say about Henrietta. And this is this is her on Henrietta. She says she will be laughed at at Constantinople, I am sure. And there's several other rather rude things that she says about the way Henrietta looks. Her, Scottishness and her face and her age and her general unfashionable ability compared to all the other younger, prettier, uh, richer diplomatic wives. So I will give you just a small taste of Henrietta's writing when she turns up, when they make it to Constantinople after this long voyage before handing over to Patrick. Uh, this view, I'm sure many of you know this print, it's not the view that she's describing in the extract I'm going to read, but she certainly would have seen it. And she described Constantinople and its landscape and architecture, buildings and bazaars, the cemeteries around the British Embassy uh, several times in the journal. And this is just one lovely example. Um, so she says, 
As we advanced, Constantinople itself opened to us, regularly ascending a range of high grounds or hills with a number of fine mosques and elegant minarets overtopping the tall cypresses with which they are delightfully mixed. Perhaps there is not in the world such a tract of water presenting a scene so gay, beautiful and interesting as this channel. It is from one to two miles broad and so formed as to appear almost to its end a succession of fine lakes. The European and the Asiatic side are equally ornamented by a variety of fairy palaces of the sultans, gardens and arbors formed by the spreading branches of magnificent trees. She's a great writer, I think, um, and her journal is very engaging, uh, has a sense of immediacy and detail and humour uh, and curiosity and wonderment at everything she sees. She's particularly interested in the Turkish women and their clothes. She writes about the food that she eats, um, the people that she meets, the other European diplomats. When the Listons travel around uh, Constantinople, for you know, excursions to get away from the plague and the heat of the city. She describes in detail the aqueducts and the forests and the cherries um, and the beauty, the beauty of the Turkish flora as well. So I recommend, I recommend her, I recommend dipping into her journal, especially those of you who know Istanbul well, and you'll be taken back in time uh, to the early 19th century and uh, the city streets. This was where the Listons lived, the British Embassy Palace, which isn't there anymore because it burnt down some years after uh, the Listons left, but the, a new building is in its place, of course. Um, and this really is where I hand over to Patrick. The Listons have arrived, they move in, Henrietta has to be this diplomat's consort. And Patrick, over to you. Thank you, Dora. Sorry, just I, I was still on mute there, I just realised. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. I'd like to begin by just seconding Dora's thanks to you all, and especially to Craig and Quentin in particular for inviting us here. Um, uh, so yes, as, as, as Dora has said, um, uh, Liston provokes some, uh, some fairly hostile reactions from the more aristocratic um, British residents or travellers passing through Constantinople. Um, this is Michael Bruce, the, the treasure hunter and, and lover of um, uh, Hester Stanhope, um, describing uh, poor Henrietta Liston as short and thick with the most ore features I ever saw. And I should think not half so genteel as your housekeeper, Mrs. Brown. Uh, she is forward in conversation, has a dash of Scotch cleverness and a considerable one of Scotch vulgarity. Um, I think these, you know, these these different accounts of Henrietta I find fascinating. And I think um, there are some really interesting questions which we're still working through about uh, Liston's, how her, her position as a woman, uh, as a Scot, um, as someone born uh, in Antigua, um, whose, whose parents were obviously involved with the, the slave trade, um, uh, or at least with, with slavery, um, who was uh, bequeathed uh, several slaves in her, uh, in her, her parents' will, um, uh, and her, her social class, um, which is perhaps not, not easily uh, defined. Um, but I, I want to focus mostly uh, today on talking about how we got from the, the manuscript uh, uh, to into print, how we got listed into print. Um, Dora, can we skip to the next slide? Is that right? Can we pass Can? over these? Yes, yes, <laughs> sorry. With time, maybe it's uh, better to skip on. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> thank you. May, so I'll, I'll be talking a, a bit more about the manuscript, the, uh, the particular manuscript we focused on, the collection as a whole, and some of the issues the manuscript threw up and, and some of the issues we had to think through in terms of um, 
whom we were preparing the book and the online resources for. Um, uh, so Dora, maybe next slide, I think. Um, the next image is uh, simply uh, the, the first page of um, the, the principal travel journal, uh, manuscript uh, 5709, um, the one, yes, that we can go on to that second image perhaps, um, the, the one that Dora has already shown you. Um, now, as, as Dora said, there are 177 volumes of this, this archive. It's a, it's a huge collection. So, and, and much of that you know, is, is diplomatic papers. Um, but even when it comes to Henrietta's own writing, there are a huge number of what, what appear, or a substantial number at least, of what appear to be uh, perhaps earlier drafts um, of passages that appear in this uh, travel journal. Um, there are her letters, which also contain passages that, um, or accounts of episodes that are also described in the travel journal. So we have, in many cases, we have two, maybe three different variant texts, all describing um, a, a single incident or experience. Um, so we, we really sort of had the problem of, of how do we present this material? What, what are we trying to do with it? You know, we, I think we all agreed that this needed to be made available, but, but we had to think very carefully about the best way to do it. Um, and I think the word material is, is really key here. Um, as, I, as I think Dora's images show, there's, there's something about the, the physicality of the items in the archive. Um, of these manuscripts that we really wanted to to be able to communicate. Um, there's, you know, and I'm sure many of you have, have worked in archives, worked with archival material. There's there's something special about uh, handling the these actual objects. Um, but of course, for many people, getting to the archive in Edinburgh is, is not possible. And, and we started this project before COVID and lockdown, of course, but even, even more so uh, now this is, this is the case. Um, so one, one issue that came up fairly early was in thinking around, do we want to produce a, a material, a, a physical book? Um, it's been for the last 30, 40, well, certainly 20, 30 years, um, uh, digital editions of women's writing that has been recuperated from the archives um, has played a hugely important role. Uh, and I think our, our first thoughts when, when we decided we needed to do something was with, with Liston's journal was, well, the obvious thing is to, is to put this online, make it digitally available. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think, again, for all three of us, I think the book um, uh, remains an, really an unrivaled technology for reading. Um, and we all felt committed just on, on that level to the idea of producing, uh, producing a book. Um, but we also felt that uh, there, are, there are good arguments, particularly when it comes to uh, women's writing from the past that doesn't already have a kind of canonical status, that isn't Virginia Woolf or Jane Austen, um, that there are really strong arguments for producing uh, physical editions. Uh, and two critics, Amy Cully and Anna Fitzer, have written really articulately about this and made the case that physical editions of uh, women's texts have served as, as they put it, tangible signs of intrinsic significance and value. And so we, we really felt that Liston's writing deserves a book. Um, the next question was, well, uh, what kind of book and, and who is this for? Um, and we realized that this material has appealed to scholars across many fields, whether interested in travel writing or specialists in Middle Eastern history, um, in, but also those interested in women's writing more broadly, um, Ottoman historians, diplomatic historians. Um, uh, 
and and also I think you know if if such a thing can be said to exist, the the general reader we hoped might might you know as as Dora said, the the quality of Henrietta's writing is such that I think this is these are just fascinating accounts for anyone to read. Um, but we were also very aware that many readers uh, who might be interested in this uh, may not have English as their first language, may not be familiar with uh, late 18th, early 19th century um, writing um, and conventions. Um, and so we were, we were struggling with these issues, you know, um, how do we keep something of the materiality of the experience of these texts as handwriting as, or as handwritten texts, um, these, these folios as, as objects, um, and yet produce some, a text that's uh, useful for, for many different kinds of readers? Um, so we realized that we needed to approach it in, in several different ways at once. Uh, and we settled on, uh, uh, and, and perhaps Dora, if we could move to the next slide, just I'd just like to flash this up as an example of the, the sort of materiality I'm talking about. Um, uh, okay, this is um, this is an, uh, just an example to, to, to give you a, a sample of what we were working with. Um, this is a, a page taken more or less from, well, towards the end of, of Liston's main journal. And at the, in the top third there, obviously you can, you can see the manuscript. Uh, below it in the middle, I've given um, a transcription um, just, to, just to make it a little easier to read, um, following as closely as possible uh, uh, exactly what Liston has written um, uh, and indicating her insertions. Um, and I think, that, you know, I just wanted to take this little example and I'd be fascinated to know what any of you might have done as editors working with this, uh, this, this sample of text. Um, so Liston writes, the term Sultana does not seem to be generally ascertained you'll notice the term there is underlined. Uh, it is not given exclusively as many persons think. And then it seems she's had a second thought as many persons used to say to the first of the Grand Signor's concubines. And then again, she appears to have had a second thought and she's written in above that wives who produces a son. Uh, nor is it indiscriminately given to all the women in the Sultan's harem. Um, now, there, there are several things to pick out here, I think, of interest. Um, firstly, Liston's underlining. Um, she's underlined here, you know, several parts, and her underlining presented us with a, a, a real dilemma. She underlines constantly, or oh, there's barely a sentence where there aren't words underlined. And often this, this in some cases, is following late 18th, early 19th century conventions we're fairly familiar with. Um, but in some cases has no obvious uh, uh, logic to it perhaps and, and certainly not for uh, not for a 21st century reader unfamiliar with uh, the conventions of the time. She also uh, underlines with a great variety of, of weight of lines so you can see here term is very lightly underlined and what we realized we began by following her underlining practices but as soon as you put this into into type, into print, the effect really changes quite dramatically um, and gives a much, much heavier uh, kind of emphasis. Um, so the underlining was a, a great issue. And in the end, we decided for the book, we, we removed uh, all her underlining, uh, almost without exception. Um, the other, other issues are where she's inserted an alternative reading. So we have, for, 
for example, perhaps the most interesting example here is where she's written first of the grand seigneur's concubines and then above has inserted the word wives. And that I think is a really fascinating sort of second thought on Liston's part. Um, wives, I think, you know, in a, in a sense, to some extent, deorientalizes um, the text a little. Um, brings it down uh, to a more uh, domestic, familiar level. And this might be perhaps reading too much into a single um, insertion or um, second thought, but, but there's, a, there's a pattern throughout the text of this kind of tendency. Um, you know, concubines, wives, have, they have different connotations. Um, uh, but it's interesting here that Liston has not cancelled out her first thought, the word concubines. In some cases, we find she'll have crossed through something and inserted a, a substitute. But often she keeps two words uh, together, left in balance there in the manuscript, almost for us as readers to take our pick. Um, and again, this uh, raises some interesting questions about what was the purpose of this, uh, this journal? To what extent was it a private document? Who was her intended readership? Um, uh, and I've given uh, at the end there um, the, the text that you would find uh, in the book um, as, it's, as it's published. But we wanted people still to have access to this. And that's why uh, we produced, and I think, I hope this is the next slide, perhaps uh, we might need to skip one. Yes, fantastic. Um, we produced the online uh, uh, digital edition, in effect, which combines uh, digital facsimiles, um, which are, I think, a wonderful resource. Do let those readers who want to really see the um, uh, see Liston's writing, engage with all the quirks of her spelling, her punctuation, her underlining, um, alongside a transcription uh, to help those. And, and on the whole, her text is fairly easy to read, but there are there are plenty of points where um, we had some some real sort of paleographical struggles. Um, uh, so this, this uh, online resource, I think, I hope will complement the book um, and let different readers sort of access it in, in various different ways. Um, uh, I don't want to, to take up too much time. So um, perhaps we can, Dora, if we can skip on to the, uh, maybe I'll pass over this. I'd be very happy to come back and say a little bit more about how Liston went about composing her work, if anyone's interested. Um, but Dora mentioned the, the plague that was raging when uh, the Listons arrived in Constantinople. And I've talked a little about variant uh, accounts of uh, different episodes and, and different events. And this is one of the most fascinating documents of all, I think, for me in the archive. Um, it's one of Hen Henrietta's letters uh, written to her nephew, Dick Ramage, in 1813. Um, and when we first came across this, we it was, uh, as you can see from the image on the left, it, it's full of slits. Um, and, you know, so we, we had a puzzle over this. And I, I should say I'm coming to this as largely a, a Renaissance scholar. And I wondered if this was... Um, an example of the kind of letter locking techniques that um, that was was still being employed in certainly in the late 18th, early 19th century, which involved often clever folding or cutting letters and threading ribbons or sealing with wax and, and folds in particular ways to protect uh, uh, from prying eyes. Um, but the work we did on this suggests and, and Liston's own account uh, suggests that these are actually disinfection or fumigation slits um, cut into the letter. So it would have been uh, effectively fumigated, disinfected before, um, 
before uh, being read uh, or being sent even. Um, and I, I want to read you very briefly before I hand over to Valerie, who's going to talk about uh, one particular case where we have three different variant accounts from within the archive about a particularly scandalous event. Um, but just to give you a, again a flavor of her writing, she, she writes of how uh, the private burying grounds um, make the ornaments of their gardens and pleasure grounds. Um, she's, she's fascinated by, uh, by the, the graveyards in, uh, behind the, the British palace. Um, during the plague, all this beauty for the time disappears. The bodies, and they often died a thousand a day, are usually placed very little below the surface of the ground and often without coffins. Sometimes the dogs, which form one of the nuisances of the country, dig them up. And at times the heat occasions a smell worse than disagreeable for it carries death along with it. Um, on that uh, rather dark, morbid note, I will pass you over to Valerie for, for more tales of death. All right, just unmuting, here I go. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, and I would like to, Patrick has already seconded our thanks, Dora's thanks, so I would like to join my voice to theirs to thank you very much for inviting us. Um, yes, um, so I am going indeed to talk about executions. Um, so both Robert and Henrietta Liston record the executions of the Marusi brothers, Dimitrios and Panagios, um, the grand dragoman of the Sublime Port and his deputy. Um, I'll start with Henrietta, then move on to Robert, and then move on to the third account, which involves a recent discovery by Dora in the archive. Um, in her journal entry for the 30th of October, 1812, Henrietta calls the Marusi's deaths a melancholy proof of the tyranny of a despotic government. She describes the Sultan uh, ordering, thank you, Dora. Sorry. I realize I completely forgot to ask for the thing. I'm sorry. Um, okay. She describes the Sultan ordering the vizier to have Demetrius Marusi cut to pieces, stating it was done immediately at Shumla in Asia, that is at Schumann now in Bulgaria. She then, and this is our slide, she then narrates the execution of um, Panagios, first explaining that during his brother's absence at Bucharest, where Demetrius was involved in negotiating the peace treaty between Russia and Turkey, Panagios had been appointed dragoman of the port. But she claims he was then discharged um, because by reason, she says, of the interest of the French ambassador, because the latter suspected that he was attached to the interest of Russia. Um, and here is our text. The killing of Panagios is then both dramatically and pathetically described. When the death of Demetrius Morusi took place to the surprise and horror of the public, poor Panagios lived retired in a handsome house on the banks of the Bosphorus with all his family. Two boats filled with shouses, um, that's from the Turkish word chavush, the guards of the Sultan and the executioners of his fatal orders carried the poor man from his sisters, his children, and his remaining brother to the port where, without a word, his head was cut off. Um, she concludes her fairly brief account by speculating on the reasons behind the Marusi's downfall. She asserts, she says, the family of Marusi's has been supposed attached to Russia. Indeed, all Greeks are less or more so, from religious principles. And she argues that this fact was used by the enemies of the, their, by their enemies, amongst whom uh, were some of those very Greek princes, she says, who insinuated his having influenced the vizier in terms of the Treaty of Bucharest, a treaty which was perceived as being injurious to Ottoman interests. Uh, however, she speculates that there may also be other reasons. She says, the display of their family consequence to their countrymen and of their superior talents 
to some of the members of the Divan, it is conjectured, contributed equally with general envy to destroy them. Uh, as you can see, Henrietta's account of the deaths of the Maruses combines her sympathy with the difficulties of the position of Sultan's interpreters, it was a dangerous job, uh, with her condemnation of Oriental despotism. Robert's account of these executions um, in a dispatch to Viscount Castlereagh, the British Foreign Secretary, is dated the 26th of March, 1813, so a few months after the events took place. It's long, it's more detailed, and it's much more circumspect than Henrietta's. But like hers, his version begins with Dimitrios being summoned to Shumla by the new Grand Vizier and, quote, put to death on orders from Constantinople. Robert then adds the rather gruesome information. It is added that as there was no regular executioner on the spot, the poor man was cruelly butchered and might in fact be said to be cut to pieces. The last three words repeating Henrietta's phrasing. Um, as for Panagios, uh, like Henrietta, Robert notes that he'd served for several years as the deputy dragoman of the port until he was removed as was supposed at the desire of Mr. And Monsieur Andriossi, the French ambassador. Adding a detail about the duplicity of the port, uh, not to be found in Henrietta's account, Robert explains that Panagios was invited by a civil message from the Ottoman M ministry to repair to the port where there was a desire to converse with him on the affairs of his deceased brother, particularly concerning certain estates in Wallachia, now part of Romania, uh, which it was the intention of government not to confiscate, but to give up to the family. Um, and you can see on the, this next slide, um, the next part of the dispatch. Sorry, sorry, Dora, no, we, I haven't got it. That's okay, my mouse is being a little annoying. Keep going. Oh, you have an annoying me. mouse. I have an annoying <laughs> cat. We, they should, we should put them together. Um, the, the dispatch continues uh, like this. Uh, Panagios obeyed this insidious summons with trembling suspicion. Uh, he was right to, be trem to tremble and to be suspicious. He entered the boat sent for him, but before landing, he found himself a state prisoner. And after undergoing a short interrogatory, he was beheaded and his body exposed on the spot allotted for common criminals at the gate of the Seraglio. Uh, this account of the executions is followed by an examination of the reasons for them. Robert concurs with Henrietta that the general opinion is that, and notice how he phrases as ambassador, he is very cautious. Uh, in, in the way he phrases things. The general opinion is that they were executed because of their involvement in negotiating a peace treaty with Russia, so disgraceful to Turkey. He argues that if this was so, um, then the executions may be regarded as connected with a system of humoring and aggravating a general dissatisfaction with the peace and preparing the public mind for an eventual rupture. Um, you'll see he's, he's much more analytic than Henrietta. However, he immediately dismisses this argument since he says, the ministers who are supposed to have a, a occasioned the ruin of the Maruses deny it. They say that none of the other plenipotentiaries who signed the peace treaty have been molested. Um, like Henrietta, again, he speculates that the Maruses enemies among the what he calls the higher Greek nobility, have taken their revenge on them for having monopolized the government in the two northern provinces um, of Moldavia, now Moldova, and Wallachia, Romania. However, Robert asserts that in the case of Panagios, the more immediate cause for his downfall was his personality. He says, Panagios was possessed of more ability and much more information than falls to the share of the Turks with whom he had to do business, which gave him respect and influence among them. But, says Robert, his manner was haughty and unpopular. He not only sh felt, but showed perhaps ostentatiously his superiority, thus making bitter personal enemies of several of the ministers. 
the ambassador judges he has cruelly suffered for his imprudence. Um, finally, in, in the next slide, uh, please, thank you. Um, Robert adds another detail. Describing the placard affixed to the severed head of Panagios, um, a customary practice, he explains calmly, after the commonplace accusations of infidelity, treason, and ingratitude, it is added that he behaved with disdain towards the sublime port and had the audacity to assume a tone of sarcasm and irony towards the imperial ministers. And you will see that Robert, like Henrietta, underlined, as, as Patrick has just been showing us, um, Robert does his own underlining. Um, I don't know if Robert's underlining is more systematic than Henrietta's. Certainly, I think in this case, he's underlining the, what he thinks are the significant words about Panagios's arrogance. Um, the dispatch continues by detailing reaction to and reflections on the executions. The fate of the sufferers has excited no common degree of sympathy and regret, says Robert, as he rather sardonically observes, the Marusi's defects have been forgotten and justice done to their merits. Their hands are allowed to have been clean, their zeal in the service of the port active and cordial, such as might have been exerted by genuine Muslims. Um, and in the next slide, we will see, um, finally, he wonders if, and here we start, if the whole has been an individual act of the Sultan, which he says um, receives a degree of confirmation from the circumstance that much a powerful intercession, and this is one of those moments where surely that should be such a powerful intercession, but it's not, it's clearly much, um, that, this, that much a powerful intercession was employed on the occasion, but in vain. Uh, he goes on, if this is the commencement of a new plan of administration, it must be confessed that the first es essay of his highness's autocracy has done him no credit in the eyes of the subject, of his subjects, I'm sorry. Um, that is from the Sultan's point of view, the executions have been a failure in terms of public relations. Um, they made the men martyrs with their defects forgotten and only their loyalty to the port remembered. Um, as I noted earlier, um, you, you'll see that Robert is very careful in his phrasing, often prefixing his comments about the executions with expressions like, it is added, uh, it might in fact be said to be, as was supposed, they say, the general opinion is, and, there are, and so on and so forth. Um, or he gives information which he says has been given him by um, figures like the imperial ministers. Um, his own break feelings do break through occasionally, as we've seen. Um, he calls Demetrius uh, the poor man who was cruelly butchered. Uh, he talks about Panagios obeying the insidious summons with trembling suspicion, and so on. And moving on, because I know we've now been talking for a long time, here are my last two paragraphs. Um, the third, um, thank you, Dora, for the slide. The third example um, of the discussion of the Marusis um, is, I can talk about thanks to a recent discovery by Dora uh, in the Liston papers, which casts a new light on these accounts, the, on the Liston's accounts of the Marusis executions. An anonymous article in French in the Gazette du Grand Duché de Francfort of the 19th of January, 1813, with Robert's annotation, which you can see uh, on your screen, um, Article de Constantinople, Famille de Maroussi, um, on the first page, um, accuses the Maroussis of plot plotting with Russia and Britain to overthrow the Ottoman Empire. Um, I won't go into all the details, but Demetrius Maroussi, it is claimed, was the chief instigate, instigator of the conspiracy, one of whose aims was to install him as Prince of Thrace with an army of 20,000 men. Um, 
the plot was financed, according to the article, by Russia and Britain. Um, the article is unsigned. It offers no evidence at all for any of its accusations about the Marusis or the Anglo-Russian conspiracy to destroy the Ottoman Empire. And it leaves us with some questions, as the, as the, the list and papers, I think, so often do. Um, was the British Foreign Office involved in secret negotiations with Russia, of which their ambassador in Constantinople was completely ignorant? If so, Roberts dispatch to Castlereagh about the Marusi's executions becomes ironic in the extreme. Or is the whole article in the Gazette an expression of French paranoia? Um, after all, uh, the Marusi's anti-French stance is just throughout. Um, now you can see in this final slide, again, we've got Robert some underlinings here, Robert underlining in the journal, uh, in the journal article, but he is, has also marked here with a little cross towards the bottom there. Um, he, he, he's marked a passage where Russia and Britain are accused of plotting to install Ali Pasha of Yanida um, as Ottoman Sultan with Egypt being Britain's reward. Well, of course, uh, Britain didn't move into Egypt until 1880, rather later in the 19th century. Um, nothing so far discovered in the list in papers supports the article's accusations. And I should say, um, I, nothing that I have read in connection with Robert Liston and the embassy's interpreters supports the accusations either. Um, but, um, but further explorations of the archive may provide more information. And with that, I will leave you. I have finished. Thank you very much. Excellent. Valerie, Patrick, Dora, thank you very much. Um, uh, oh yes, yeah, so just uh, say a little bit, how, how can people get um, the book? Uh, yes, it's online. Um, you can purchase it online with Edinburgh University Press, uh, the hardback or the ebook version, but exclusively through the National Library online shop, the paperback version, which is more affordable, uh, but has all the same content. Uh, you can also, sorry, my ability to switch slides is very slow. You can also see all of the digital material, the facsimiles, the wonderful collection of long reads that we commissioned uh, through the National Library's digital gallery at the address the web address just there. And you can also join us on Twitter at Henrietta Liston, where we share other little insights uh, to her writing um, on all the countries that she visited and insights into the archive as well. And um, we could maybe talk about the long reads, uh, but I'll just give you, since we've got Mac here with us, um, uh, an example of the kind of thing we've got. We've got, as you can see, three wonderful and very different contributions allowing us a bit more kind of interpretive work on Liston's journals, one from Maureen Freely, one from Donna Landry, and one from Gerald McLean. And they're also all online uh, in the online, freely accessible open access online resource. And we're adding to these long reads all the time. We've got a botanical artist coming up, uh, Valerie's uh, one is also pending, and then a very interesting piece on Liston and the world of slavery as well. Uh, but I'll stop sharing my screen now. Excellent, thank you. And um, I'm glad we also had a shot of the, the National Library's Mouser. <laughs> um, every every build, big building should have one. Um, anyone want to sort of open with a question? wave your hand or chat or use the, the Zoom function. Um, uh, if, if, if anyone wants to start off, um, if not, I mean, I'm intrigued by these, the drafts and the, what were the, a lot of the documents in the list, in, let's say the dispatches, were they drafts? Um, or were they copies of the final dispatch? Because presumably the final dispatch would be in London. Yeah. 
they're both their copies and their drafts. I think you find both and um, possibly other versions as well, depending who's written. It might be Robert Liston's first own draft, or it might be in the hand of a secretary that we find a dispatch. Um, or it's a copy that was then translated into cipher, that cipher document I showed. So there's a whole range of those official dispatches in all kinds of different forms. But yes, copies and drafts are the most part. And the originals are in the Foreign Office archives. Yeah. Um, okay, and um, with the Amarusi brothers, mm. I mean, yeah. once the dispatch gets to London, presumably someone would comment on it or send it up to uh, the minister and uh, uh, you know, were you able to find any other commentary on the dispatch? Um, sorry, is that for me really? I no, I haven't I haven't found any personally um, but we Dora only came across to this very recently, so we haven't really had a great deal of time to explore, and I certainly have not had time to um, to investigate um, the the Foreign Office archives. I don't know if they're digitalized. I'm afraid I haven't done that yet. Um, no, they're not. I, I'm sorry, that's really not a very satisfactory answer, Quentin. Um, but, uh, I, I, I mean, I assume you, you haven't had the chance yet, but it's just an interesting Oh, it's, it's, thought, it's, fascin it? it's fascinating. Um, and I, I mean, I would also be curious to know, I mean, it, it, it's made me just seeing this draft, Robert's draft, the draft to, 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 of, the, of the dispatch to, to Castlereagh, and then this Gazette article, it's made me regret all the more <laughs> not being able to investigate the archive when I was in Edinburgh because it, I have a feeling I, I might well have got into exploring more about Robert's writings because I think he, I think like Liston, he writes extraordinarily well. I mean, this is something we haven't commented on, but I think he writes extremely well. Um, it's, yeah, sorry, I, I'm repeating okay. myself. Uh, so um, a question, well, a comment uh, from, um, Sue Kentish yeah. and a question. Um, uh, thank you so much uh, for a fascinating talk and look forward to reading the book and the online editions. Can you tell us whether the two executed dragon were employed by the British Embassy? No, no, I, I, I did say, but I probably skipped over it fairly quickly because um, I did have my, my eyes slightly on the clock. Um, they were employed by the, um, the Divan, the Ottoman Imperial Council by the Sublime Port. Um, I'm happy to tell you that none of the British Embassy's dragomans, to my knowledge, was ever executed. Um, I've just been, um, the, the long read, which, is, which will be by me, which will go, be going up soon on the Liston website, is actually about the Listons and their interpreters, official and unofficial. So both the Embassy dragoman, dragomans uh, and, the, and the women who acted as Henrietta's unofficial interpreters. Anyway, so they were employed by the Sublime Port. Um, they, the Marussis were members of um, a community known as the Fenariot Greeks from the Fener uh, area of Constantinople, which is where they lived, most of them. Um, and uh, they, you, you had, I mean, the Dragomans, Dragoman history is fascinating because you, you had um, families which, which had whole din din Dragoman dynasties, which went on for generations with several members of the same family being employed as Dragomans, sometimes working for different embassies. So it, it's um, very, very interesting. Uh, I hope that answers your question, Sue Kentish. Yeah, thank you. And Val, I think to add to what you just said, you're going to do you know, more, perhaps more research into Robert Liston's relationship with his Dragomans and also Henrietta's relationship, because they had quite a, an interesting, close, uh, checkered um, history together, the British Embassy Dragomans and, and the Listons. And there's definitely more that we could do with that story. And there's lots and lots of little clues to their relationship in the archive, like how some of the dragoman named dragomans named their children after Robert and Henrietta, uh, for I example. Know, I know that. Oh, we yeah. found that only because it's recorded in an expense 
account for the listings paying for the baptism of, of the children and then the names are recorded. So there's all sorts that we could uh, do with that. Um, yeah, with that aspect of the Liston's lives in Constantinople, which we never got to in the confines of our book. No, I mean, I think it's, it, as, you, as you said, Dora, it's, it's a sign of the richness of the archive. Um, you know, I, I know that the, the principal dragoman, when the Liston's left, said that the very pavements of the city would be sorry that the Liston's were leaving. It's a wonderful phrase. Um, any other questions at all? I see we also have uh, Donna Landry here with Gerald uh, McLean, um, so two of our long reads authors. Um, I've got another um, question. So were the Listons um, linguists in any way or were they totally reliant on their dragomans? Who would like to start? <laughs> I'm sure we have things to say about this one. Patrick, maybe. Patrick, you take it. Sorry, stuck on mute again. Um, Dora, I think you probably know more about this uh, and, and Valerie too, come to that. Um, I mean, certainly Robert Liston was an incredible linguist. I think he spoke, yeah. uh, certainly, certainly read uh, 12 languages, 10? 10. 10. 14. Well, 14. <laughs> depending on what level we're talking about the number okay he read, he read 14 and he could speak 10. Yeah. And, and how did that come about i mean obviously he, he had he been posted to the uh, sublime port to the to turkey before yes just for one year 1794 1795 but he he had showed a natural talent way back in his kind of student days for languages yeah right and, and uh, as a sort of follow-up question is how was that post regarded in the rank of posts at the time the highest i would say i, mean, I don't know whether anybody in uh, in this event can um shed more light on it but certainly robert as british minister to the united states was much lower he wasn't an ambassador he was just a minister the united states didn't get their uh, british diplomat ranked at ambassador level till really late on in the 19th century but the ottoman empire was the big one and the one that robert had been waiting for i think for his entire career so it was high very high ranking and robert was one of the few uh commoners i think or or um people born without a title to actually hold that post. So he was quite rare um, amongst his, the other the other people who filled it. I think it would, if I might just add something, I think it would have been, yeah, I think Dora's absolutely right. It would have been very important because the period where they were there, well, in fact, the whole of probably the revolutionary, the French Napoleonic Wars and thereafter, and then until about 1830, at least, I think um, it would have been a very important posting because you had France, Britain, Prussia, Russia, Austria, all anxious to exercise diplomatic um, pressure in various ways on the Ottomans. Nobody wanted the Ottoman Empire to be overthrown because they all, there was a, a, a balance of power struggle going on and, and mm -hmm. so I think it would be have been a very very important posting for that reason and it stayed that way for, for a long time. Um, on the subject of languages the other thing that we have been looking into was the use of Italian in Constantinople as well and there's quite a lot of Italian documents in the library. Patrick and I when we went through the archive at early stages we kept coming across Italian and, fr and French of course but those are the two other most represented uh, languages in the archive, Italian and French, but Italian vowel has been looking into a little bit. We're still to do more research on that. Well, yes, because we, we've, we've set what I and Patrick also have found scattered comments to the effect that sometimes there was what, what's known as two-tier translation. Um, translation, not just from straight from Ottoman Turkish to 
English, for example, but Ottoman Turkish through Italian to English. Now, of course, with Robert, he, he spoke Italian so that he could have just, you know, he could have, that could have been translated there. Um, despite his knowledge of languages, um, during his very sh first short posting, he talks about learning Turkish, um, but then uh, a, I think it's an article, Dora, isn't it, written by his doctor towards the end of Robert's life, where yeah. he explains that although um, Robert spoke some Turkish and understood a great deal, he always worked through an interpreter. He never yes. did without the interpreter. Mm -hmm. uh, this is after he's retired and so on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's in itself interesting, I think. And that same article talks about or describes what happened to Robert at, towards the very end of his life when he was in his 90s. And he knew all of these 14 languages and he must have developed a form of dementia at the end of his life. And what happened was that he began to speak in all of the languages that he mm -hmm. knew at once. So he was unintelligible and he also started to have visions and one of the things that he has visions of was people in ottoman dress so i you know that that kind of experience at the end of his life took him back to his life in turkey uh, good uh, a question from uh, gerald mclean um would anyone care to speculate about what uh, lady hester stanhope meant by henrietta's Scotch vulgarity. <laughs> my, my, my first speculation is, is a question too. Could it be anything to do with being careful with money? Because there are one or two comments in, in her journal um, where she comments on, the pro isn't there one about the Turkish, the, the, the hammam, the baths being, yes. the price being quite reasonable and, and um, you know, I, I think I, I may even have commented on the contrast between that and the kind of things that, that Mary, Lady Mary Wortley Montague talks about. So could it be something to do with money? I don't know. I mean, Dora and Patrick know far more about stereotypes of Scot Scot Scottish people than I do. So I, I, I'll hand over to them. I'll keep quiet here. I'm, I'm, I'm sure money comes into it and social class. Um, and possibly, I don't know if, this is where I, I don't know, and if anybody else would know, that would be very helpful. But I don't know if Henrietta's colonial origins might come into this or... or oh, not. very likely, yeah. Um, but I also think, I mean, Henrietta's journals are full of sort of examples of where she makes, she uses sort of very down-to-earth, homely similes um there's one point i can't remember where she is now but she's i think she's somewhere oh she's at the house of local argo in Bunabasha. um and she talks about uh uh she compares the sort of dressed milk to devonshire clotted cream and somewhere else she talks about i think it's a different description but she talks about how um the turkish dishes are placed upon a stool upon a large round tin tray resembling our girdle or griddle in Scotland for baking cakes. Um, when she's describing the, the whirling dervishes, um, she says the rest of the dervishes began to wheel round, extending their arms and making by means of their wide petticoats what children call making cheeses. And this is a we think a Scottish children's game played by girls where they'd spin round singing turn cheeses turn you know, all about cheese making so I think there's also something probably about her range of reference uh the kind of language the kind of simile she's making um there, there may be something of that as well I think going on I mean I was going to just say a follow-on question if I may because it, it does that then did that lead to an iterative process for you when you were going through it because you didn't know yet know her character? So if you look at the wives concubines thing, what was her mind like? Did you understand her mind when she wrote that? Or did you have to go back around and around after you'd read a lot and say, well, actually she probably meant this? Yeah. <sighs> 
I think more of the latter than the former, perhaps. Um, but I, I, I think we, we're, we're still not sure. And and it's, you know, I, I certainly want to res. You know, we we have in those cases in the book, we've made a a decision on a reading. Um, so in that example, we went with wives, as that seems to be the second choice. But but you know, she hasn't cancelled out concubines as she does in in some other cases where there were, she's clearly had a second thought um in in those cases we've we've indicated with a footnote you know where there's an alternate reading in in most cases but in others we you know uh i i sort of don't want to you know as an editor i think or as editors we don't want to sort of push readers um, more than is necessary in the process of producing a, a, a readable text um, um, into a particular interpretation. Um, it, it's one of the sort of fascinating ways the, the manuscripts sort of remain open to interpretation. Yeah. Um, Dora? Might... Yeah, it's just, it's a really interesting question about her character and what we thought it was. And her journals are one thing and then her letters are another and she's often a lot more critical and outspoken and unguarded in her letters and that goes for when she was in the US as well and I, I really like love Henrietta and I love to try and work out who she was and what her character was but it's maybe it's too tempting to try and read everything through that kind of assumption especially when there's so much still to be researched and especially as we don't really know her before her middle age and I think that's quite important there are these big gaps in our knowledge um, uh, I think yeah. the fact that she's seems at times reticent in her journal about expressing the kinds of strong opinions we find in the letters particularly mm. perhaps on sort of political diplomatic matters mm. also raises for me some really interesting questions about who is she writing this journal for um she she says in she talks about it in her letters um she talks about sharing it uh with individual friends and and going over it together and perhaps even revising it and we've got what look like drafts where robert liston you know we can see in his hand he's made suggestions that she seems to incorporate but always rephrasing things into into her own language so I think so I'm just looking at, at Sue's question about did she intend her letters for private consumption and her journal for public and it's it's a really fascinating question that I don't think we can answer there's no we have no indication yet that she ever intended the journal to be published in print but I think again our ideas about you know print being public and manuscript being private don't sort of map properly onto this situation or really onto this period um i think clearly she she was intending perhaps a small coterie of friends back in scotland to read this read this journal um and perhaps to use it as a sort of um a base for working up letters and and accounts um for other purposes but but mostly i think it's still a, it's still an open question and, and aren't, aren't we discovering, aren't we and, and other scholars also also discovering that, um, especially perhaps, I'm not sure if this is true, but perhaps maybe for women, there was this intermediate stage between the private letter or journal and the public publication, sorry, no, but where, where manuscripts were circulated, discussed among women. I mean, an early example is Mary Wortley Montague, uh, long before the letters were published, the year after she died in, for the first time in 1763, um, in the 1720s, she shows them to the feminist Mary, Mary Astor, who writes a preface. You know, this is, has a long history, what well, at least goes back to the early 18th century. Um, can I come back to the concubines and wives question? Because it's, it's particularly interesting, of course, because I don't know, maybe Patrick or Dora does, I don't know exactly how much Henrietta knew about um, the history of the Ottoman court, the Ottoman sultan and the relations with the concubines and then the wives, because of course, for a very long period, sultans never married. 
you know, they didn't marry, they just had concubines. So there's that uncertainty hovering about those two words as well, I think, isn't there? It's not just a question of her own character. Mm -hmm. It's about the evolution of relationships within the Topkapi Palace, um, the Sultan and his entourage, I think. I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think, again, that's where the fact that she hasn't cancelled out one of those options mm -hmm. maybe suggests that she's not sure and it's something she wanted to you know, come back to and leave open for the meantime. Uh, can, can we just, um, a question from John, I'm yeah. curious at the time, um, mm -hmm. uh, how did they view their compatriots, British residents at Constantinople? Uh, I can tell you a little bit, if I may, about the way Robert viewed some of the British merchants and he got rather fed up with them on a fairly regular basis, <laughs> um, I think, because they thought that the dragomans, the interpreters of the embassy, should be protecting their interests. And um, Robert was, was frequently at odds with the Levant Company. Um, and the Levant Company paid the ambassador's salary, still, when Robert was ambassador, um, because the Levant Company felt that he wasn't defending British mercantile interests um, strongly enough. And so I know that Robert, I mean, I've, I've, you know, there are exchanges. He gets um, very, very upset with um, some, some merchant from Zante complains about the way he's been treated. And Robert, Robert says something to the effect of, OK, the manner was outrageous, but as to the matter, he was absolutely right. And you're wrong. Um, so to start us off, I don't know if anyone else wants to come in there. I think they formed a huge part of their work, their, their British compatriots. They were constantly requesting things from Robert and using up the, the hospitality of Henrietta and being entertained. So there, there's such a lot of work. That was the sensation I got from the archive. Um, and like Val says, there's kind of disapproval, but also their friendships. And I think there's a few occasions where there are young men in, British young men in Constantinople who Robert and Henrietta just tell to go home because they're not, they're wasting all their money mm. and they're behaving badly and <laughs> go home and grow up. Um, and then there are lots of young women, well not lots, several young women who are badgering Henrietta for a position in the British Embassy Palace as her, uh, her companion and she never says yes to them. Uh, she's quite self-sufficient. She has one or two maids, but she doesn't want that kind of companion of a, of a slightly higher status. And I think um, further investigation to the archive would just show the span of relationships they had with the other British people um, in the city. I mean, I also think it's interesting that um, they, of course, had friends among the other diplom other diplomatic community, mm -hmm. not just the British. Um, they were very friendly with the Spanish ambassador and his wife, and the Russian uh, representative, the Chevalier Chelinsky, and so on. For example, mm -hmm. I think that's interesting too. Yeah. Um, it's, I'm afraid our time has um, run out, but a fascinating discussion, and and I guess. The last thought, I mean, there seems to be such a lot here, so many uh, rich themes that uh, one could follow. Where does this go next? What other, you know, angles may you or others be looking to explore amongst the papers? <laughs> shall, I, shall I go? I, I maybe have the most sort of limited... <laughs> take on this in a sense. Um, I mean, I'm very interested in looking at the Listons and particularly Henrietta in relationship to the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, I think there are continuities there that are, are really worth exploring. Um, the way she writes about views, for example, um, seem, seem to sort of pick up on ideas that, that are circulating in the Scottish Enlightenment. And the Listons were you know, again, we we need to know more about Henrietta's sort of earlier life in, in Glasgow, or, or it would be wonderful if we could, um, but but certainly seem to have been really embedded in, in sort of Scot Scottish Enlightenment circles um, in, in Glasgow. Um, that's, that's an avenue that I'm interested in exploring. 
I suppose from my perspective, um, I found that that article in, in this uh, gazette of the, the Grand Duchy of Frankfurt extraordinary. And you know, I think that raises a lot of questions I'd like the answers to, but I'm not sure whether or not I, I'll be able to explore that, I am not sure, but it, it certainly is interesting. Dora's the keeper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Yeah. The you? other day I found out, um, I found a letter where Robert describes his dreams to a friend, his dreams of flying. So really there's innumerable oh, yeah. avenues that we could take. We could do a project on Robert's dreams. Yeah. There you go. I think most, most outlandishly of all, perhaps, I've been uh, talking with a friend who's a, a, a screenwriter in LA um, about converting the Liston story into a Netflix series. Um, I, I don't suppose that's ever going to take off the ground. The odds seem very long, but um, it, it's sort of wonderful that it's exciting that kind of interest at least. Well, and, and Genghis uh, Dahan has got a question. Yeah, any benefits of looking at this from the perspective of the Osman archives? Yes. Maybe then you'll get your Netflix series. <laughs> yes, yes, we um, must. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's it's a shame that Usden, you know, the the three of us already, but Usden, uh, who worked with us on the book and who has a chapter or a, or a section in the introduction, um, does uh, look to so at least to situate um, Liston's writing in relation more to, to Ottoman sources, um, and I think there's there's absolutely work to be done there and one of our hopes is that you know people with the required skills uh, will pick up on this and, and do that kind of work with it as well yeah absolutely well thank you very much indeed i mean a really fascinating uh piece of work fascinating story and and uh, you know we can all approach it from different aspects i mean if you know we can help through the levantine heritage foundation through our network um, do please ask. Uh, I know one of our uh, trustees, um, she's a specialist in Italian documents, um, Zeynep Suvari. Uh, you know, ask away uh, and maybe we can connect you up if you, as you follow new avenues. But um, thank you very much. Thank you, our audience. Um, and uh, you know, please do come and join us uh, on future occasions. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.